is up guys, welcome back to another GeekerWatt video and today I'm going to be showing you how to build a $1000 gaming PC build step by step. I'm going to run through all the parts that I selected and why, the build process including all the little fiddly cabling and wires before booting this system up and testing it with the most popular games on the market so you can see exactly how it performs. Without any further ado though, let's jump into it. As always, I'm gonna kick things off by installing our CPU and the RAM into the motherboard. And this is the MSI B550 Tomahawk board. Now, if you wanted to save a bit of money, you could also pick up a B450 board, but this is packed with loads of great features and some really good future proofing. I'm gonna couple it with the CPU choice today, AMD's Ryzen 5 3600. Now, AMD have of course just announced the new 5000 series desktop chips, but there is a little bit of a price bump on those, so we'll have to see exactly how they perform for a build like this. Line up the triangle on your processor with the corresponding triangle on the corner of your CPU socket. The chip is gonna drop nice and easily into place before you push the arm back down. I'm going to stick with the stock cooler for today's build. It comes included for free with your CPU and is actually surprisingly quiet. To do this we first need to remove the pre-installed stock mounting hardware. A magnetic screwdriver is also a good shout if you're a bit clumsy like me. And once we've done that we can just line up the cooler with the back plate and screw it down corner by corner. If this is a brand new unit, it will also come with pre-applied thermal paste, so no need to worry about applying your own. And all that's then left to do is plug up the four pin PWM fan cable to the CPU fan header at the top of the motherboard. Finally, the last step today of our motherboard assembly, so to speak, is to install the RAM. Now this is 16 gigabytes of Kingston's HyperX Fury RGB. Installing it is pretty simple. You need to pull back the clips on the second and fourth dim slots before lining up the notch on the memory. That's this little gap just here with the corresponding one on your motherboard. Apply even pressure with kind of both of your thumbs and repeat for as many dims as you've got. If you've only got two, like me, then the second and fourth slots are the ones that you want. Don't ask me why it's the second and fourth. It, it, just, it just kind of is. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Next up then, we've got our case. And this is a brand new chassis from Antec. It's their DF600 Flux. This is part of their new Flux series. And this is a case lineup specifically aimed towards high airflow. So you know your temperatures are gonna keep nice and low. Now inside the case, you're gonna find this box. We've, we've got an extra fan. That's a, that's a fifth fan, five fans. This case is like quite cheap as well. What you'll actually find, and this is what I was looking for, is the included case accessory box, which includes all the screws and stuff we need to secure the motherboard into the case. In particular, it's these screws that we need and all the standoffs are pre-installed in the right locations. We're gonna slide the motherboard into the case and screw it down standoff by standoff. The next step then today, while our motherboard and stuff is still easy to access, is to power everything up. Now this here is an 80 plus gold unit from Antec and is available in a range of capacities at all in all a pretty reasonable price point. But for up to date pricing of all the components today, I will pop some Amazon links in the description below. All right then, it's already got basically all the cables we need plugged in. We just need to add in a SATA power connector into the power supply's semi-modular interface. First up, I'm gonna plug up the 24 pin motherboard power cable. It's the biggest of the bunch today and goes to the right hand side of the motherboard, just like so. Next up, I'm also gonna do our eight pin or dual four plus four pin to be precise CPU power connector. And that goes to the top left of the motherboard once again, just like so. I'm going to come back to our SATA and GPU power cables a little bit later on. In the meantime though, it makes sense to plug up our front panel connectors. That's basically all the ports at the top of the case, the power button, and all that good stuff. First up is your USB 3 header. This can be a little bit delicate and a little bit fiddly, so be careful and don't force it. Next up then is our HD audio connector, and this plugs up to the bottom left of the motherboard. 
And then finally, we've got the fiddly front panel cables. If you get these the wrong way around, don't worry. Nothing's going to explode. Your system just won't turn on. And I've popped a diagram on your screen to make this as easy as possible. With that cabling and wiring now all wrapped up, thankfully not literally, all that's left to do is install the SSD, which in this case is a one terabyte SanDisk SSD+. Plus. It's cheap, cheerful, not the fastest SSD around, but a lot, lot quicker than any hard drive option. And then of course, pop in the graphics card. Specifically, this is MSI's RTX 2060 Super Ventus. I've used this GPU a lot, it's great values, got great reviews, and at 1440p, as you'll see in just a moment, and of course 1080p, it's an absolute beast. Nvidia may come out with a 3060 soon, you know, they've done the 3090, 80, and 70. You know, let's be honest, it's probably on the list. But at the moment, I'm not hearing too many rumours, and this is still a great card to pick up. To install this, we're just going to pull back our PCIe slot cover and remove the second and third PCIe metal, bra metal brackets. Push back the clip on your PCIe slot and then line the notch on the gold PCIe slot of our graphics card with the corresponding one on the motherboard. So that's going to clip nice and easily into place before being secured down with the same screws we just removed. Finally then, we're going to remove one of these SSD mounting brackets that comes on the back of the motherboard plate. And we're going to secure our SSD drive into this just like so. And we're just going to plug up a SATA data cable to the drive. That's this one that comes included in your motherboard's box. Same goes for your power supplies SATA power connector. There we go, before sliding the drive back on to the motherboard tray, just like so. All that really leaves us to do then is to plug up a six plus two pin GPU power connector. Oh, and I mustn't also forget, we've got some optional Antec 120 mil fans. These are from their prism range and you know, they're just gonna add a little something to today's build. With that being said though, that pretty much wraps it up for the build process today. All that's left to do then is to boot this machine up to see how it looks when it's all powered up but more importantly, exactly how it performs. Roll the montage. Okay then, now you've seen just how good this system looks when it's all powered up with all those RGB fans and of course the build process of putting it together, let's see exactly how it performs. I've tested a variety of titles today, ranging all the way from the latest, most intensive AAA titles to some slightly older but still very popular games. Kicking things off though is GTA V. Here at 1440p high settings, uh, with the render bars at around about halfway to give a really nice balance, you're looking at 118 frames per second on average, with 106 and 92 FPS for the 90 and 99th percentile results respectively. These are some really respectable numbers in GTA 5, and if you wanted only to game at 1080p, you'd be looking in excess of 150 FPS quite easily. Talking of high frame rates, Apex Legends is next up. I once again benchmarked at 1440p, but wait for it, medium settings. Uh, so we're going for that slightly more competitive angle. And here you're looking at an average of 110 frames per second. Visually, the game looked great, no lag, no stuttering, no screen tearing. And the 90 and 99th percentile results of 97 and 92 indicate the game never really went below 92 FPS, which is a kind of borderline esports experience. Experience. Once again, 1080p, 150 plus frames per second here. Next up is Call of Duty's Warzone, a game that I did test at 1080p. It's quite intensive, even with ray tracing disabled. You're looking at 109 FPS for the average and 94 and 86 respectively for your 90th and 99th percentile results. Next up today then is Forza Horizon 4. Here at 1440p high settings, you're looking at an average of 140 FPS, tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, with 130 and 119 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Visually, the game looked insane at 1440p high settings, and I think nothing comes too close to Forza in terms of visuals. Next up is Overwatch at... 
1440p high settings, the high preset with an unlimited FPS target, and of course, VSync disabled, you're looking at 145fps on average, with 138 and 131 for the 90th and 99th percentile results. Overwatch looks insane when you crank those settings up, and I know it can be tempting to go 1080p, low settings, and get 300 FPS, but I genuinely think this is a much better balance, and the image is so much sharper. Next up today, then, is CSGO. 1080p high settings, you're looking at an average of 321 FPS. Need I say really any more at all. The game looked pretty good for CSGO and 321 FPS at 1080p. It doesn't get much better than that. The penultimate title today is Battlefield 5. I used 1440p high settings but with RTX disabled. As much as the 2060 Super is a great card, in terms of ray tracing in Battlefield 5 it just hasn't quite got enough punch to get the frame rates you guys are going to want. 93 FPS on average though is a pretty good result with 90 and 87 respectively, meaning that frame rate really was very, very consistent. The most consistent of all the titles today. Finally then, the last game is Fortnite, and I used Nvidia's new DLSS support in Fortnite to really maximise our frame rate today. More on that in a second. 1440p high settings, you're looking at 137 FPS with 112 and 96 FPS respectively. Uh, DLSS on balance mode basically renders the game at a slightly lower resolution for all you competitive players out there and then uses AI and machine learning to dynamically upscale the image to give you the sharpness and visual fidelity of 1440p but the frame rate of 960 or 1080p. With that being said though that pretty much wraps it up not only for the benchmarks today but for the whole video. If you did enjoy it make sure to give it a big old like rating and get subscribed. Thank you very much for watching and as always we'll see you in the next one.